Thank you for coming to my talk today. Yesterday I was in room 125. <laughs> I was uh, earnestly giving my, my second talk to a room of two guys who are also going off the same outdated schedule. So meanwhile down the hall, some of you might have been waiting for me to show up and I never did. Uh, but I'll be around today to kind of go over that topic, um, which was self-replicating modules on Mars. Um, but today the topic is I make Martians. I said that on a whim on my LinkedIn page about six months ago as my new byline, and boy did it get attention. And I realized that's kind of intriguing to people. It's something they haven't really thought about, is the fact that there are no Martians. There aren't any that exist. There aren't any of us in this room or on this planet that could last more than two years on Mars before you killed yourself, someone else, got yourself killed. These three guys were the very best that we thought we could muster, excluding a few women that we, we ruled out. Um, but once we had decided it had to be white boys, this was what America came up with. They chose the cream of the cream of the crop, but a very particular crop. So, what these guys essentially were was astronauts. Not is Greek for sailor. And that's a great thing to be. And indeed, they were Navy pilots, test pilots. They were really good at piloting. They knew how to get places. And that's pretty much what they did. And they busted their butts, and they beat out all sorts of competition for like 10, 15 solid years, depending on when you start the clock. And after all that, we had three perfect people to do what? Go camping for two days. Less than two days. <laughs> we made it two days on the moon. We didn't even bring anything to, like to cook food with. Like It was absolutely more minimal than this. 12 years of training, three of the best people we could find on the planet, and that's what we were capable of. And that was you know, a few days from home. We're not going a few days from home. We're not going sailing. We don't need sailors. These are sailors, and they're awesome. And they might be extremely elite and well-trained for a decade, but they only do this for 12 hours. Sailors are awesome. They're nothing compared to settlers. Settlers are gods compared to sailors. Sailors are little boys. You'll note settlers are women, men, children, old people, strange people, <laughs> and all of them stuck together. And that's a clue as to why this is harder to train for <clears throat> than astronautics. Why do we want to go to Mars? A lot of people say, well, it's inspiration. It's going to be motivational for humanity. It's going to raise the ceiling and broaden our imagination and make us feel hopeful about the future. And no one should knock that. Like, that's absolutely essential. If we pulled off nothing on Mars, but continuing to make people feel like the future was hopeful, then we've done our jobs. Like, we probably averted the apocalypse. But that's what you get when you go camping. Astronautics gets you that. Visiting Mars gets you that. Same for knowledge. If you stay on Mars for six months or a year, you get knowledge. If you rotate people in and out, like Mamerta Station in Antarctica, you get knowledge. And we all feel a little smarter and we're probably also benefited somewhat well. But the really convincing reason to go to Mars is because this can still happen. Last I checked, we did not have a perfectly fail-safe array of gravitometric satellites around the Earth out to three astronomical units that could stop every single asteroid from killing us. Last I checked, we didn't have a single satellite out there that can detect in time or terminate or you know, redirect this. So this is going to happen, and it might be tomorrow, it might be in three minutes, it might be in three million years. And the really strong case for Mars is also the one that makes settlers necessary. Because if we start on Mars in the name of having a backup for Earth, as Musk likes to say at SpaceX, it means nothing if it's a camping trip, or if it's McMurdo Station. If there are people on Mars, and they have nothing in the way of self-sufficiency, their ability to make their own rockets, their own food, their own everything, in perpetuity, then they will not bail out Earth. They will not save us when something the size of Los Angeles hits Los Angeles. And the entire argument that really sells Mars, that being for our survival and the fact that a two-planet <coughs> biome is almost indestructible, it's an empty argument, unless this starts to happen. <clears throat> well, the cool thing about Mars is it doesn't care why you went there, 
it eventually, combined with human nature, is going to result in autonomy, independence, autarky. And the reason is, is because you're 15 light years or light minutes from Earth. So even if you want to be dependent on mission control and daddy and mommy, and you want to have an Amazon Prime style Mars experience where when something breaks, you order it from Jeff Bezos and it arrives a year later, you're going to die. When one guy develops insulin who didn't have it at the start, and now you're in, out of insulin because two people fighting over it, you're dead. Well, one of those two is dead. Or they're both really miserable, and then something else fails, and then everybody's dead. So Mars is going to dictate that this autonomy happen, <clears throat> even if we don't stretch for that stretch goal of having a survival backup. Even if we think we're there for a camp out. Mission control will be a joke. So what are we training for? We're training not for an astronaut, not for a hotshot flyboy with a cool head who can do like, you know, seven weeks or seven days in a can and 10 minutes of amazing pilotry. We're looking for Leonardo da Vinci. Anybody know how many Leonardo da Vinci's we've had on Earth? We've had one. And if he's just da Vinci, he's gonna lose his mind because da Vinci was mentally fragile and socially inept. And we can't afford even one of those on Mars. So we need a Da Vinci or 50, and we need every single one of them to also be a Navy SEAL. How many Navy SEALs are there? It's about 500 alive right now, give or take. So we need Da Vinci's that are Navy SEALs. How many of those have we ever had on Earth? Zero. We also need monks. Here's a little kid. He's probably uh, between four and eight years old. And uh, his parents have deemed it justifiable to send him off to become a monk because, you know, humans are weird and we decide to sacrifice children all the time to weird stuff. His job, starting from the age of four, is to be chill no matter what and to be able to let anything roll or slide or go. And he's already really good at it, probably better than everyone in this room. But we need a Da Vinci Navy SEAL monk and we need everybody who goes there to be that. Because if you talk to anyone who's been in a submarine, anyone who's been in Antarctica, anyone who's been to the moon, or the ISS, they'll say, I miss food, I miss Mars bars, I miss steaks, I miss the most basic stuff from my childhood. The more extreme and stressful the environment, the more lethal, the more constant the threat of death, betrayal, psychosis, um, the more hopeless the situation, the more we regress. So, we go back to being four years old. We want comfort. We want things even more basic than sex and snuggles. We just want good food. But no, on Mars, you're going to have algae every day of your life. So you need somebody who's nostalgic for algae. You need somebody who did not grow up soft. Neil Armstrong was not training to go to the moon until at least 18 in any real sense. He was not spending the years where he was forming these regressive associations, eating algae, trying to guess what Tang would be like, trying to basically, you know, hardship proof himself. He was as weak as the rest of us when he cut down to the core, because when he was four, he was having the same lucky charms and cereal as the rest of us. That's why you need a monk cave. That and the gloom of being constantly in tunnels and under extremely low light, you can't even have Norwegians keep from killing themselves, and they're surrounded by Norwegians. <laughs> Guess what? <laughs> Tally marks here. This is what prisoners do when their life gets too repetitive. That's before they snap. We need people who are hyper competent, running the prison, not doing this. This is what happens when you put 50 people into a social circle uh, without any outside governance. This is the end of Hamlet. This is what happens when you have a pretty good team of 50 people, and one of them likes the other guy's wife a little too much. That's all it takes. And then you have six dead and complete destabilization. 50 people are an extremely fragile system. Notice none of them are monks. None of them have practiced from childhood going without lucky charms and other people's spouses. You have power structures, inevitably, especially without mission control. They put four people in the biosphere too. They formed two factions of two people each within a month, and they, they didn't talk to each other. It might have been three and three. But that's, that was a year-long excursion, and that was five miles from home. So we need people that have spent their life thinking about 
poor Julius Caesar here and his unwitting uh, knife set that he got for his birthday. People are going to die on Mars, so even if you get those 50 people to work like clockwork, then you pull one of those pieces out, leaves a big hole in the other ones. But they can't stop for a split second to be distracted. Emergency room doctors can work on their own kid, but at the end of the surgery, they go home and collapse. But there's no collapsing on Mars. How many people do we have on Earth who can handle actually working with and loving everyone around them, and also just randomly losing them? That's what we need. We need people who are Navy SEALs and lunks and monks, who've spent plenty of time alone and in the gym, but also understand deeply what's inside the heads of themselves and everyone around them, master psychologists. And they need that not just for the day-to-day -day social interactions, but for this. You could be Neil Armstrong, perfect flyboy, really fit, and your suit rips, and you know you're only one minute from the airlock, and you know your physiology, so you'd make a sprint for it. But without being a monk, you're going to run the wrong direction. And on Mars, there are going to be people, people that die because in a panic, they ran the wrong way, thinking that was home. You can't just be Neil Armstrong. You can't just be a Navy SEAL. You have to be a monk. So what else do you have to be? How else do they need to be like Navy SEALs? Well, this is the terrain that you're sprinting across if your suit does rip. So you've got to be agile. So when we're training people, whether we start at 20 or 5 years old, this is what their PE classroom needs to look like. This is what their PE class needs to look like. When you're in 38% gravity and you weren't evolved for that, and the last 4 billion years worth of ancestors aren't used to that, you need to have your vestibular system checked. We don't know what that does. We have a few people that have been on the ISS. They were in microgravity. We need to be able to develop people on Earth for an environment they won't know until it's too late. This is Wim Hof. He's the Iceman. He knows how to climb Mount Everest without oxygen or a shirt or a self-respecting pair of pants. He did Everest in shorts and sandals. He did that because he knows how to handle cold, how to control his own body, all the way down to the most autonomous nervous system components. Here he is after swimming like 100 meters under ice. And he's happy. We need Wim Hofs. These are Fijian divers. They have bred themselves into having spleens three times as large as normal, so they can go underwater actively for 12 minutes. That's handy if your suit's ripped and you have 10 seconds before you're unconscious, a minute before your heart stops. If you can be trained in these ways, if you can start young, you want to. You want to have a Navy SEALs mindset. I talked to a guy who was at McMurdo Station. He said, I always have plan A, B, C, D, and E for every single thing. He said, my friends think I'm in psychotic. And then they saw plan C fall into necessity. And then they saw plan D become necessary on a different day with a different blizzard or a different <coughs> contingency arising. He said, I've never had plan E come to pass. But that's why I have plan E. We need people that are not just problem solvers like our schools like to say now, but are master problem planners. So we do need Da Vinci. What's a Da Vinci now? We need somebody who's a good field doctor. Because if you have 50 people on Mars, you can wait a year for insulin to arrive. You can wait for somebody to uh, you know, have remote telemetrics to do surgery, but every single movement of the scalpel is going to take 30 minutes for some Earth doctor to guide. So you need to have Da Vinci is the no field medicine. You need to know how to do extremely advanced farming. This is the most sophisticated farming on Earth, by the way. This is a Mayan farm, and they know how to grow 17 different crops on the same piece of land. They know that that's the only reason that you can keep biodiversity on your, uh, on your plantation from collapsing during a blight um, or some sort of pestilence. So we need people to go down, study the Maya, and learn from a young age the intricacy of growing 17 kinds of plants in the same space. We need to know even more crucially about microbes because they're even more essential to living on Mars. They are the most robust form of biodiversity. With this type of Da Vinci knowledge, you can grow your own insulin. You tell your poor friend, like, hang in there, buddy. You're going to have a bad week, and then we'll have some insulin growth. You need to 
know metallurgy and mining because that's the only way we're going to be independent. You need to know chemistry and physics and biochemistry and biophysics. You need to know this entire symphony. You need to know what this guy in the third row on the third violin is doing. Gold. You need to know how his music mixes with silicon over there with the timpani drum. You need to know how to play this whole orchestra. <clears throat> if you want Mars to be autonomous from Earth. You need to know genomics, genetics, how proteins form and fold, the advanced computing needed to do it. And in a pinch, if Earth really does go, we need to be able to build ENIAC again from scratch. So we need kids to be studying this in kindergarten. Because unless you start in kindergarten knowing what a logic gate is and how to assemble them to do subtraction and addition, then they won't be da Vinci enough. They won't make the timetable. You'll have an 80-year-old who's kind of ready to go to Mars. But at some point, the complexity gets insane. So you also need a mindset that isn't scared of this, which is my favorite map of all time. That's the equation that a Mexican physicist just came up with to solve how to make a perfect camera lens. And I thought, I'm bad at math when I saw this. But I forced myself to reduce it to some more basic patterns. So I was able to identify, oh, this is all one thing. That can be simplified to one variable. And this is one thing. And eventually, you learn how to see through the complexity and become MacGyver. This is the closest we've ever come to fantasizing about what a Martian looks like. He doesn't have a fetish for complicated materials, the latest technology. He doesn't care if it's complex or simple, expensive or cheap, glamorous or extremely filthy. He just cares about making the solution manifest out of any available parts, always keeping it as simple as possible, but no simpler. And he stays pretty cool doing it. I think he's half monk. But we don't just need one. We need a bunch. And one thing we know about human beings is that you can have identical clones and put four of them in a team together, and one will become the leader, and one will become the joker, and one will become the asshole. And basically it's the Ninja Turtles, or the Power Rangers, or the Avengers. And they need to learn how to work as a team, even though there are undercurrents in their psyches that will make them take roles like this. And you might think, who's crazy enough to think they could possibly become the Avengers? MacGyver, Leonardo, the Navy SEAL. Basically gods. We've been manifesting this same understanding of what we potentially are for 5,000 years. These are Egyptian gods, stylized like Avengers. This is the Greek pantheon. This is what we need to be aspiring to become if we're going to make it, and if we're going to protect Earth the way we can at our very best. Who's crazy enough to do this? Four-year-olds. I see these kids in the streets of LA on walks. I saw a kid with a Martian outfit the day I was wondering if this idea for a school of mine is crazy. And I realized it's not insane, because they're not insane. We're insane for saying that's a cute Halloween costume but now we need you to go play football and practice how to write cursive and other things that are obsolete and soon to be extinct. We don't have any schools for kids that take them seriously when they say they want to be this, even though this exists. We will torture a four-year-old her whole life and make her useless for anything but gymnastics just to get a gold medal for our country. And America does it too. We just let the parents select the kid instead of the state. This happens for very stupid reasons. We don't want this. We don't want any crying kids being forced to learn how to go to Mars. We just want to be able to tell them it's not insane to want to do that. And you can spend your life practicing to do that. And it's not a waste of your life. Like <clears throat> this almost certainly is to some extent financially in terms of her other potentials. It's an extremely narrow field with extremely few people who can call themselves successes or come out the other end feeling like it was worthwhile. Meanwhile, this is happening. If you train a bunch of kids to go to Mars and you take it super seriously, and you make some sort of extreme school, 
that starts at five. Because remember, Neil Armstrong started at 18. He was barely ready for a camping trip after 12 years. If you don't start at four, how are you going to end up with people on Mars that are still young enough to reproduce, yet skilled enough to handle more than a camping trip? It's 12 years for a camping trip. So you put these kids in schools, you take it seriously, you have them eat algae three days a week, you have them practice meditation and balancing in the dark on a board and doing weird team exercises. And basically it's a crazy cult. It's extremely intense. It's just like this, except the kids are happy because they're the kids that wanted to go to Mars. Is this something we can do in good conscience? Why would we ever put a kid, you know, in that much certainty that they might actually get to go to Mars? Why would we devote so much of a whole human life to that in a free country? Well, this is the alternative. This is the Earth that they're preparing to live on. If you don't train them for Mars, put them in a normal school, put them in a different school, put them in a Montessori school, put them in a Harvard design school, a Benjamin Franklin style open school. Pick your school. This is the Earth that they're preparing for. That's the coastline when they're grown up. Everyone who lives in the red will either be living on a yacht or will be migrating into other states and destabilizing and collapsing those economies and those societies. And that's in a rich country. That will be happening all over the Earth. How sure am I? Not very sure. I'm not like absolute infinite certain that global warming is happening. But I do know this has happened. That's the LLC on the left in 1989, and that's it 30 years later. That's because some guy in uh, Moscow decided they needed to grow cotton. So one of the largest lakes on Earth turned into that almost overnight. So that's the Earth we're training kids for every day, a billion of them at a time. And suddenly it doesn't seem so insane to think if we train them for that, then we've trained them as best as anybody possibly could for what this is about to be. And they're going to be the masters of whatever planet they find themselves on. Thank you. I, think you, I, I appreciate some of what you're saying, but I, I, I think you're fundamentally misunderstanding the human condition. The, the fact of the matter is that we don't need supermen. We need people who are specialized in their, in their talents so that they can, you know, I mean, that is how human society has developed to the point where we are able to make camping trips on the moon. Um, and you make a remark to the effect that, you know, 50 people is much too small for a society. That's in fact how our species has lived for 99% of its entire history. Be careful. I like both your points. I think there's two separate points there. One is 50 people. We spent millions of years in groups of 50. The problem is in groups of 50, we've never seen a case that wasn't absolutely patriarchal with violence as the main settler of disputes. We've never seen a group of 50 that didn't have a drug induced like worldview where the shamans do their shaman thing. If we think that is compatible with a Martian base, then I say do it because the alternative could be extinction. I'm happy to work with what we have in the human condition. And that brings me to your first point, which was, we don't have societies, even in a group of 50, where everyone needs to be a doctor and a chemist and a miner, exactly. It's just that if you boil a truly self-perpetuating human society down to 50 people, there's more than 50 hats we're currently wearing. Sure. You end up with five hats per kid. So in my school, the theme is there's a core. Everyone needs to be a Navy SEAL, a sort of Da Vinci in spirit, and a monk. That's non-negotiable. Similar in the military or other organized societies, everybody goes through boot camp. Everybody has the same basic training. But then you decide, I need five doctors and six scouts and so on. So I do foresee that you would let kids negotiate among themselves and say, well, if we all want to be the cool doctor, somebody still has to volunteer to, to also learn how to fix the toilets. And so we're going to have them negotiate, figure out which kind of Superman they each are. So that we have the Avengers. Yes, thank you. Has, any, has anyone, have you or anyone else given any thought to the role that genetic engineering can play to make people more compatible with an off-world environment? I have. Yeah, I did a talk yesterday, and I can connect with you afterward, and we can talk about that. Absolutely. I'd love to. What's your name? Lou. Lou and Jason. So yeah, let's do that. Yeah. Uh, have you thought about death on Mars? Uh, you mentioned it, but I'm thinking more particularly about private property ownership 
whether the first Martian settlers will leave assets behind on Earth, <clears throat> what happens when they die, will they be bills on Mars, what about appointing guardians on Mars for their children, yeah. uh, their sense of well-being, knowing that their affairs are taken care of. Have you thought I, about all those issues? No. And in fact, that's part of where I find the most fun. What I covered today is kind of like grades kindergarten through high school. But you're talking about high school and college level stuff, which is absolutely crucial. I think one thing I see from human nature is property rights have to be protected. You can't end up in a tribe where the women and children are forced to live under the hut, which is what happens in the Amazon to this day, because they're smaller. You need everybody to have some sense that their contribution will be rewarded fairly. And I think that's the crucial core of it. And it bleeds out into issues of how will wills work, how does well, inheritance or tax work. Of assets. Right. Ta is, who's it go to? Do the kids yeah. get all of it? Do we tax it? I think that's an infinite ocean of fun to think about. Absolutely. Well, I'm, I'm writing an article about it. Fantastic. All right. I want to connect with you. Um, anybody else? All right. 20 seconds to spare. All right. Thank you. Thanks, guys.